A very good evening, aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 1st of June 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles that I have chosen for today's discussion. See, today all the four topics are very very relevant for your upcoming preliminary examination. In today's discussion. I had made a point to enable you to revise certain factual topics also I had taken few other topics to give you awareness of those thing which may be straightly put forward as a preliminary question for you okay so without wasting much time now let's get into the first news article discussion now have a look at this news article this news article mentions that the demands of the endosulfan victims remain unfulfilled we'll see what is the issue but before that what is this endosulfan endosulfan appears as a brown or colorless crystalline solid with a pungent odor it is used as a pesticide particularly it is a broad spectrum organochlorin this pesticide works as an insecticide and acaricide see insecticide means it kills the insects that are detrimental for crops and acaricide means it kills the subclass of arachnids which is acari okay This acari subclass includes ticks and mites. Also, this endosulfan is volatile and persistent. So it remains in air, water, sediment and biota. Plus it also has the potential to bioaccumulate in aquatic and terrestrial organisms. Bioaccumulation refers to the gradual build up of a chemical in a living organism over time. So what is the issue with this pesticide? The main issue is it is toxic by inhalation, skin absorption or ingestion and causes many health issues. Its persistent and bioaccumulating nature further aggravates the problem. Due to this, it has negative impacts on humans. In humans, it leads to neurobehavioral disorders, cognitive disorders, hydrocephalus, mental retardation, cancer at younger ages and other severe lifelong illness among female children see hydrocephalus is a condition that increases pressure within the head and makes the head to grow in abnormal size and this leads to brain damage and ultimately death endosulfan also causes abnormalities related to male reproductive system see it also impacts environment and other organisms It leads to mass deaths of bees, fishes, birds and also causes congenital deformities in domestic animals such as cows. So now what is the news background? See, endosulfan was used in certain districts of Kerala and Karnataka. It was used by way of aerial spraying over the cashew plantation since late 1970s. Aerial spraying led to increased exposure to endosulfan. But the problem is Only in 1990s it was found that the pesticide is toxic to human beings and environmental ecology. In Kerala and Karnataka it caused congenital abnormalities in humans and children were born with birth defects and deformities. Many children became mentally retarded and fully bedridden. So after realizing its effects first the Kerala High Court banned the sale and use of endosulfan in Kerala in 2002. Then the Kerala state government banned it in 2003. It also provided various benefits to the victims such as financial assistance, free ration, treatment, pension, educational scholarship, etc., etc. But the central government did not believe that endosulfan causes problems. So it even opposed to list endosulfan as the NXA chemical under the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. See if a chemical is listed in the annex A to the convention then the parties to the convention must take measures to eliminate the production and use of such chemicals India is a party to the convention but it did not vote for listing endosulfan as annex A chemical taking cognizance of the serious impacts of endosulfan The National Human Rights Commission also made several recommendations in 2010. Mainly, it asked central government to take administrative and legislative action to ban endosulfan. Then secondly, it also recommended to establish a centrally sponsored palliative care center or hospital. 
Thirdly, it asked the state government to provide compensation ranging from 3 to 5 lakhs. See, after this, Supreme Court intervened and passed an ad interim order in 2011 which banned the production, sale and use of endosulfan in the country till further orders are passed. But the news is, the recommendations have not been implemented and even the compensation is provided only to few victims. So that's all about this news article. See, this is an issue that is spoken for a long time and it is seen in news frequently. So just being aware of this kind of chemical which creates so many issues, especially health issues and environmental issue, will be very much useful for attempting your science-based preliminary question. Okay? And just this awareness will help you attempt a question. That's why we took this topic and discussed it in an elaborate way for your preliminary point of view. Also, we discussed about the issue because you can use these points, you know, to enhance your main answer. That is why we gave the recommendations of the National Human Rights Commission. These points all, you know, you can use to enhance your mains-based questions. Okay? So, these key points in mind. Now, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. The 118th meeting of the Permanent Indus Commission took place in Delhi on May 30 and 31. This news article is about this meeting. According to the Ministry of External Affairs statement, the meeting regarding the Indus Water Treaty was cordial. The Ministry also noted that the annual report of last year was finalized and signed during this meeting. This is about the news article. See, in this context, let us revise about the River Indus and the Indus Water Treaty both in prelims perspective. Okay? See, this is very much important for your upcoming preliminary examination. So, kindly pay attention to this discussion and note each and every point in this discussion. It is absolutely going to be useful for your preliminary exam. First, let us take up the Indus River. The Indus, also known as the Sindhu, is the westernmost of the Himalayan rivers in India. The Indus originates from the Bokarchu Glacier in northern slopes of Mount Kailash, which is 6,714 meter height. After originating in Mount Kailash, the river then flows through the trans-Himalayan ranges of Karakoram, Ladakh and Zaskar and finally through the Great Himalayan ranges. In Tibet, Indus is known as Singhi Kamban or Lion's Mouth. After flowing in the northwest direction between the Ladakh and Zaskar, it passes through Ladakh and Baltistan. It cuts across the Ladakh range, forming a spectacular gorge near Gilgit in Jammu and Kashmir. Indus enters Pakistan near Chilar in the Dardistan region. Note here, the Indus flows in India only through the Leh district in Jammu and Kashmir. The Indus receives a number of Himalayan tributaries such as the Shayok, the Gilgit, the Zaskar, the Hunza, the Nubra, the Shigar, the Gasting and the Dras. The Indus River finally emerges from the hills near Atok in Pakistan where it receives the Kabul River on its right bank. The other important tributaries joining the right bank of the Indus are the Kuram, the Tochi, the Gomal, the Vibhua and the Zangar. They all originate in the Sulaiman ranges in the Afghanistan. The Indus River then flows southward and receives the Panjanad, a little above the Matankot. Note that the Panjanad is the name given to the five rivers of Punjab. Who are they? They are the Satlaj, the Bees, the Ravi, the Chenab and the Jalam. Before we see about the major tributaries of Indus, let us see about the drainage pattern of the Indus River. Like most of the Himalayan River, the river has antecedent drainage. What is antecedent drainage? See, antecedent drainage or inconsequent drainage is formed when the flow of the river is obstructed by an upliftment of landmass. This is due to erosion by the river. Even after the upliftment, the river still follows the same slope. The antecedent drainage has features like deep gorges. See, in the case of Himalayan rivers, they were flowing into the Tethi Sea before the Indo-Australian plate collided into the Eurasian plate. 
these rivers had their source in the tibetan region and they were draining into the prehistoric tethi sea once the indian plate collided with the eurasian plate the himalaya started racing the rate at which the himalaya rose was lesser than the rate of undercutting or vertical erosion done by the himalayan rivers this is the reason for the himalayan rivers including indus having antecedent drainage hope you guys understood the basics about antecedent drainage and the reason for indus to have antecedent drainage now let us move on to the tributaries of indus first let us take up jhelum where does it originate jhelum rises from a spring at verinag verinag is situated at the foot of the pirpanjal range in the southeastern part of the kashmir valley here pirpanjal is a part of the middle himalayas jhelum flows through srinagar and the ulu lake before entering pakistan through a deep narrow gorge now what is a gorge gorge is a narrow deep valley formed by the erosive activity of a river see the jhelum forms a natural boundary between india and pakistan after entering pakistan the jhelum river joins the chenab near jang in pakistan now let us move on to the chenab river first known that the chenab is the largest tributary of the indus chenab river originates from the zaskar range in lahul spiti which is near the baralacha pass in himachal pradesh it is formed by two streams the chandra and the baga these both know will join at tandi near kelong in himachal pradesh hence chenab is also known as chandra baga okay the river flows for 1180 km before entering into pakistan like we already saw the chelam river joins the chenab near jang in pakistan now let us take river ravi ravi originates west of the rohtang pass in the kulu hills of himachal pradesh the river flows through the chamba valley of himachal pradesh in india it flows between the pirpanjal range and the dauladar range We saw Pirpanjal range is a part of the Middle Himalayas right Dauladhar is also a part of Middle Himalayas River Ravi also forms a natural border between India and Pakistan okay see the river enters Pakistan and merges with the Chenab river near Sarai Sindhu in Pakistan okay now let us take up river Bees the river Bees originates from the Bees Kund near the Rohtang pass at an elevation of 4000 meter above the mean sea level the river flows through kulu valley and forms gorges at kathi and largi in the dauladhar range it enters the punjab plains where it meets the satluj near harki the satluj originates in the rakas lake near mansarovar which is at an altitude of 4555 meter in tibet in tibet satluj is also known as langchen kambab Initially the river flows almost parallel to the Indus for about 400 km before entering India. Satluj enters India by forming a gorge at Rupar Himachal Pradesh. It passes through the Shipkila on the Himalayan ranges and enters the Punjab plains. No doubt this river feeds the canal system of the Bakranangal project. See this is all you have to know about the Indus river system for preliminary examination. So each and every point can be easily put into a preliminary type of question. So now let's continue the discussion with the Indus River Water Treaty in a brief manner. See the treaty was signed at Karachi by Field Marshal Muhammad Ayub Khan, who is the then President of Pakistan, and Sri Jawaharlal Nehru, who is the then Indian Prime Minister, and Mr. W. A. B. Ilaf of the World Bank. This was signed on 19th September 1960. The treaty however was effective from 1st April 1960. According to the treaty, India has absolute control of all the waters of eastern rivers. While if you ask me about Pakistan, it shall receive for unrestricted use of all those waters of the western rivers which India is under obligation to let flow beyond the permitted uses. Here the eastern rivers will be Ravi, Bees, and Satluj. And what about the western rivers? It includes Indus, Jhelum, and Chenab. See, this point is very much important for your prelims questions. 
What is that? India is having absolute control of all the waters of the eastern rivers while Pakistan is having control over the western rivers. Okay. Then according to the treaty, India and Pakistan undertook to establish a permanent post of commissioner for Indus waters. The two commissioners constitute the permanent Indus commission. Each commissioner will be the representative of a government for all matters arising out of this treaty. The important role played by the Permanent Indus Commission is the implementation of the treaty. So these are some of the basic points that you have to know about the Indus Water Treaty in preliminary perspective. So that's all about this news article. In this discussion, we saw about the Indus Water, its tributaries and what are all the points that are mentioned here in this discussion is going to be very, very useful for your preliminary examination because these are all the facts that you can revise for your upcoming preliminary exam and note that all these points are straightforwardly mentioned in your NCRT books. So utilize this opportunity to revise this entire topic. Let's hope that a question is straightforwardly asked from this topic. Okay. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this article. This is with reference to the remand of Delhi Home Minister Satyendra Jain to Enforcement Directorate custody. This is done by a special CBI court on Tuesday. This was done after his arrest in a money laundering case. See, let us not get deep into the issue. Instead, let us utilize this opportunity to learn about the Enforcement Directorate in prelims perspective. Okay? See, the Directorate of Enforcement, that is ED, is a law enforcement agency an economic intelligence agency. It is responsible for enforcing economic laws and fighting economic crimes in India. It is a specialized financial investigation agency and it is under the Department of Revenue which is under the Ministry of Finance. It enforces certain laws. What are they? The first law is Foreign Exchange Management Act 1999 that is FEMA. It is a civil law. The officers are empowered to conduct investigations into suspected contraventions of the foreign exchange laws and regulations and impose penalties on those adjudged to have contravened the law. Now the second law is Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002 that is PMLA. It is a criminal law. Here the officers empowered to provisionally attach or confiscate the asset and to arrest and prosecute the offenders found to be involved in money laundering. See, the Directorate of Enforcement was established in the year 1956 with its headquarters at New Delhi and it is headed by the Director of Enforcement. Besides directly recruiting personnel, the Directorate also draws officers from different investigation agencies like Customs and Central Excise, Income Tax, Police, etc. These are all done on deputations. Okay. There are five regional offices which are at Mumbai, Chennai, Chandigarh, Kolkata and Delhi which are all headed by special directors of enforcement. Okay. As we have seen, it is responsible for enforcement of the Foreign Exchange Management Act 1999 and certain provisions under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Now you can have a look at some of the other functions of ED. See, some of the other functions include it should handle adjudication, appeals and prosecution cases under the erstwhile FERA Act also, which is the FERA Act at 1973. Then it should process and recommend cases for preventive detention under the Conservation of Foreign Exchange and Prevention of Smuggling Activities Act also. Okay. Then it should undertake survey, search, seizure, arrest, prosecution, action, etc. against the offender of the PMLA offense that I mentioned before. See, go through these functions because this may be directly put as a preliminary type of question. Okay. So that's all regarding this news article. This enforcement directorate is one such body which can be easily put as a preliminary type of question. That's why I took this opportunity to discuss this topic today. Okay. So note each and every point in this discussion and make use of it for your revision purpose. Okay. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this news article. The news article discusses about India's position regarding the customs duties moratorium on e-commerce trade. Let us see what this issue is 
and we'll also see few facts about WTO or World Trade Organization which is very much important for your preliminary examination. See the issue here is there exists a moratorium that is temporary ban on imposing customs duties on e-commerce or electronic commerce trade. Its origin can be dated back to 1998. See the 1990s was decade when e-commerce started gaining prominence. So due to its growing importance in global trade, WTO members that is World Trade Organization members deliberated on the matter at the second ministerial conference held in the year 1998 in Geneva, Switzerland. As a result, they adopted a declaration on global electronic commerce. One of the main aspects of this declaration is it included a so-called moratorium stating that members will continue their current practice of not imposing custom duties on electronic transmission. Remember, this was just a moratorium that is a temporary ban and it was supposed to extend forever. One of the reasons for this moratorium was it is technically not possible for the customs to collect duties on digitalized products like software. But even after 21 years, the moratorium continues. It has been extended at every ministerial conference of the WTO. But due to pandemic, the 12th ministerial conference has been postponed for two years and is planned to happen this month. We will then know whether it is continued or not. But here, we have to know what India wants. See, India wants to remove the moratorium. One of the reasons behind this is it leads to tariff revenue losses. See, customs duty is one of the revenue sources for governments. So, a ban is adversely impacting developing countries because they are majorly importers of e-com goods and services. According to a UN Conference on Trade and Development study, in 2017 alone, developing countries incurred a US dollar of 10 billion potential tariff revenue loss. This is due to the moratorium. We will see more about the issue, the benefits and disadvantages of the moratorium when the 12th ministerial conference happens. Okay. Now, as our prelims is fast approaching, let us see few facts about the World Trade Organization which will be very much helpful for your preliminary examination. See, it was created in 1995 by the Marrakesh Agreement of 1994. WTO is the only global international organization that deals with the rules of trade between nations. But it is not a United Nations body. Note this point again, it is not a UN body. The primary purpose of the WTO is to open trade for the benefit of all. So its goal is to ensure that trade flows as smoothly, predictably and freely as possible. For this, it takes up many roles such as it operates a global system of trade rules, acts as a forum for negotiating trade agreements, then it also settles trade disputes between its members, etc. etc. Its headquarters is at Geneva, Switzerland. Know that it has 164 member countries which represent the 98% of world trade. And India is also a member since 1995. And these members only run WTO. So all major decisions are made by the membership as a whole. Decisions are a result of negotiations and are normally taken by consensus. That is why WTO called a member-driven, consensus-based organization. Okay? So, that's all about this news article. In this news article, we saw about the moratorium issue that is going on. And then we saw about the WTO, which will be very much useful for your preliminary examination. So, with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion, which is the preliminary practice question discussion. See, today I have two questions for discussion and two questions for quiz. So now let us see the first practice question. It is with regard to the World Trade Organization. It is a three statement question. See, whenever you have three statement or multiple statement question, always try to approach with the last statement or the statement that is present in more number of options. 
So now let me start with the third statement. Read the third statement. Its top most decision making body is the ministerial conference which usually meets every year. See here the first part of this statement is correct. That is the ministerial conference is the top most decision making body of the World Trade Organization or WTO. That part is correct. But it meets every two years and not every year. So that part is wrong. So this statement is incorrect. When you know that statement 3 is incorrect, you can eliminate two options here. What are those? Option A and B can be eliminated. Now you have two more options. In that, you can very well know that statement 2 is present in both the options. So straight away, go read the first statement and see whether it is correct or incorrect. Now look at the first statement. It is an outcome of Uruguay round negotiations. See, this statement is correct. Uruguay round which lasted from 1986 to 1994 only led to the WTO's creation and its rules. And this resulted in the Marrakesh agreement that I mentioned during the discussion. Okay. So statement 1 is correct. Now read the question carefully. The question is demanding for correct statement. So your answer here will be option C 1 and 2 only are the correct statements. Okay. Now look at the second question. See this second question is taken from the 2021 UPSC prelims. I took this question based on our Indus River system discussion. See whenever you are thorough about the facts that to these questions are directly taken from the NCRT book. So I took this opportunity to show you that how relevant is our discussion today with respect to your UPSC preliminary examination. Now read this question. With reference to the Indus River system of the following four rivers, three of them pour into one of them which joins the Indus direct. Among the following, which is one such river that joins the Indus direct? So here four options are present. What are they? Option A, Chenna, B, Jalam, Option C, Ravi and Option D is Satlaj. Now before telling the answer for this question, look at this map. See in our discussion, we saw that Jalam joins the Chenab near Jang in Pakistan and we also saw that Ravi joins the Chenab near Sarai Sindhu and if you look closely you can see that Chenab joins Satlaj. Finally the Satlaj is the one that joins Indus. So the map is clearly showing that it is Satlaj that joins Indus river directly. Okay so what is the answer for this question? Yes, you are right. The answer for this question is option D, Satlaj. Okay. See, if you have any doubt regarding this question, go back to the Indus River System discussion. Hear it one more time and note all the key points mentioned in that. Then come back to this question and approach this question again. Okay. Now displayed here are two quiz questions. See, one question is regarding the Enforcement Directorate and these statements are clearly discussed in our discussion itself. So if you have clearly understood what we have discussed, you can easily eliminate and find the correct answer. See, be careful with the question. It is demanding for incorrect statement. So find the correct answer and post it in the comment section. Okay. And our next question is very, very easy because both these points I had discussed in my today's endo self and discussion itself. If you have clearly listened to it, then it's a very, very easy thing. I had mentioned these two as quiz question because you can recollect the points and be aware of both the topics. Okay. Go through both the questions and post your answers in the comment section. The correct answer for this will be posted in the next 24 hours. Okay. And with this we have come to the end of the news article discussion today. If you like this video, do like, share and comment and don't forget to subscribe to the Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.